Dobré dopoledne z klubu Evropa plujícího na hladině Vltavy pod Pražským Vyšehradem. Dneska se tady setkáváme dopoledne se čtyřmi spoluobčany z Evropské unie, kteří žijí v Praze a budeme se bavit o tom, jak cizinci, kteří žijí v Čechách, vidí současnou situaci na české politické scéně v rámci Evropy a možná i to, jak se Česko za tu dobu, kdy tady žijou, změnilo. Abychom se všichni rozuměli, povedeme tu debatu anglicky, ale já nejdřív představím naše hosty, začneme od dámy. Mariana je z Maďarska, Matěj je kandidát na pirátský kandidát se číslo 15 na dovole do Evropského parlamentu a je původem ze Slovenska, Alex je původem z Francie, a David is from the UK. So just to start guys, maybe can you just like say a little bit about yourself, how long have you been here, what brought you here? Mariana? Okay, hello, my name is Mariana Chinger. I've been living in the Czech Republic for about nine years now. Uh, I took up certain jobs uh, and I came here for family reasons. I have a son who is half Czech and uh, I'm kind of back and from commuting, commuting between Hungary and Czech Republic because I've been involved in politics in Hungary recently. So that's all about me, I think. Thank you. Alex? So, yeah, I'm Alex uh, Guia. I'm um, French, so I put H where I shouldn't when I speak English. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I came here in 2012, and that's also the year when I joined uh, French Pirates. So, mm -hmm. uh, I'm not any more member of the French Pirate parties because I live uh, far away, and the French abroad are quite French abroad uh, who are interested into the French Pirate Party. And it's a small community, so that's not. It's more interesting to be involved with Czechs. <laughs> in that case, I came here for work, but. Uh, at the time, I remember I would not move without the help of a Czech girlfriend. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so a little bit of family reasons uh, too. Family <laughs> reasons as well. So I have both at the same time, which is quite unusual. And so I'm here for six years now. Okay. Oh well, uh, thank you for uh, having me here. Uh, I came here in 2002 uh, as a student. Uh, firstly, I lived in uh, Brno, and then in 2007 I moved uh, to Prague uh, for work. And uh, currently, I'm a member of a pirate party, Czech pirate party. Uh, I was a city council member at Prague for, and uh, run right now I run uh, in the European election as. Uh, Candidate number 15 for a pirate party. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is David, Dave Fisher. I moved to Prague in 1990, so just after the revolution, mm -hmm. and I've lived here since then. I have a, a Czech wife and a, a five year old boy, next nice. speaks English Czech. And um, I'm, I'm very ignorant and I'm not from the world of politics, so I hope I will be. Uh, have some contribution to make, but, um, but I've been traveling a lot and I, I run an educational theatre mm -hmm. in the Czech Republic, so we travel to cities every day and play shows to, to help teach English, basically, so it's oh, English teaching theatre, so, but I travel all over the Czech Republic with my theatre as well, so I've got, I've got a lot of common general knowledge of the Czech Republic and experience from meeting people. So you all guys have been living here for a while? So maybe like this is a question for everybody. Uh, we don't need to keep order. You can whoever wants to can start. Uh, do you feel like the uh, Czech reality or you know the country, this country or maybe the society changed in a certain way since you've been here? Do you feel like no matter if it's like 30 years or 80 years, do you feel movements? Do you feel like it's a different country than the one you moved into? Uh, well, if I may start, mm -hmm. uh, I think I, I came here before uh, Czech Republic became the member of the European mm -hmm. Union, so I can compare the period before we were members of the European Union and now, and for me as a foreigner it uh, changed a lot, uh, because uh, in 2002, uh, for me as a person from uh, Slovakia, uh, as a student from Slovakia, 
uh, it was uh, difficult to get the healthcare here in the Czech Republic. I was uh, entitled only for the emergency service, mm -hmm. and uh, for a regular healthcare service, I had to travel back to Slovakia. And also, there was uh, difficulties when you would like to travel to another country at the borders because of customs um, and uh, customs searching and so on. So, uh, and now we live uh, in an uh, open uh, Europe when you can uh, travel free and uh, study free and uh, you have uh, healthcare and it doesn't matter in which country do you live in mm -hmm. so I think this is uh, like a huge change for me. How about you guys? Do you feel there changes? Uh, well, I'm an experienced migrant but, but not here in the Czech Republic because I kind of lived pretty much everywhere in Europe in, in each side. I started in, in Denmark in 1996 and that was way before Hungary joined the European Union and uh, I remember I was applying for a, a scholarship in Copenhagen University. I wanted to study uh, classical philology and uh, back, uh, you know, uh, no, it was not 19. Yeah, it was 1996, and um, uh, it took me uh, quite a while to collect enough money to to support myself, and uh, I I gained that kind of scholarship. But obviously, I had to support myself, and I had to apply for a student visa, which in the end I didn't get you know, because you, because of bureaucracy, and. Um, when uh, young people, um, you know, refuse to go to the voting booth, they should consider the fact that th what, what they can lose, in fact. Uh, yeah, and and uh, after joining the European Union, it was no longer a problem. So the only thing you, you have to think about is just having enough funds and finances and, and you could go pretty much everywhere and study at each and every university you just want to be, which for us, old people, you know, was just a dream. And uh, obviously we can, we can work and, and, and travel without any sort of um, uh, boundaries pretty much everywhere. And, and uh, I don't think people understand uh, what is at stake now. So, uh, if you consider these kind of values as values, then um, please consider uh, the 24th and 25th here in the Czech Republic. Go and vote, please. I mean, that's very little thing to do. You know, just get up, go there, and put the cross, preferably to pirates here, and uh, you know, and, and then only then you can complain. Thank you. Are you looking at me? But uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't have as much of an experience of life before Europe because I'm born as a European citizen. Mm -hmm. and I think I'm the only one uh, around this table. You are. <laughs> the European citizen. Well, you are as well, probably. Oh. Yeah. Well, oh, yeah, my yeah, yeah, my. Yeah, UK joined the uh, Union or that was the CEU at the time uh, in '79. And I was born before as a European citizen at the time, so just a little. But as well, I traveled uh, later. I moved uh, to Holland and then to Czech Republic, so I have a bit of experience as well, but I was always within the EU. And I remember when I went to Holland, sometimes people had to ask me for papers I shouldn't have to provide, because I should be treated uh, equally as the Dutch. And so that was kind of Sesame saying, oh yeah, but I'm a European citizen. Oh yeah, yeah, sorry. It's, it's something, you know, we have it. I, I always enjoyed it as an advantage to be able to travel and to have the same rights as the locals, except speaking the language. But uh, yeah, you sometimes have signals that you can lose it. If you, if you don't pay attention, it's just in everyday life. But I've never experienced the problem of being really uh, an immigrant with all the red tape and, and so on. So I can't compare with any your So you, you might have seen a difference. I just saw how great it is to, <laughs> to be able to travel and live in a different country. And that's such an interesting point that um, SR came just after the revolution, so it's 1990. So the, basically the communist infrastructure was here. And for me, it was, it was wonderful. It was like, uh, like a kind of communist Disneyland for me. So <laughs> from, uh, I just finished university, and then suddenly there's real... Maybe like a trip to the past? Yes, it really was. It really was. It's like this world that kind of... Because the wall came down, and it was equally interesting for me to come here as it was for 
Of course, all the Czech students were going, why are you coming here? We've been waiting to go to England. <laughs> and now you live in England, why would you come here? This is crazy. It's very difficult to understand. But, um, but it's very interesting what you say, because there was a very interesting half that experience, which is part of the Czech recent history in Slovak and Hungarian as well, of course, of, of living in a totalitarian-based society, which is very interesting to think, but, and it's changed a lot, of course, since then. And we're saying that for the first, in the 90s, there was a big shift. When I first came in 1990, I, I was a minor celebrity purely because of being from a Western country. Mm -hmm. And many, many semi-homeless people would turn up and have wonderful lives because everyone was so keen to meet them and meet a person from the West. And it's like, it was amazing. And then that faded out after about five years. I think Czechs realized that, well, oh, maybe they're just kind of normal, actually. They're not, they're just not, <laughs> there's people from another, there's nothing that special about them. But, um, but now it's like an interesting shift, because I work a lot with young people and we play our, our shows in schools. Mm -hmm. And so I can see a big shift, certainly in terms of how people are comfortable with English and communication. And also because we play, I can compare, we're playing Poland, we're playing France, we're playing Slovakia, we're playing Hungary sometimes as well. We just come back from a big tour of France now. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the level of English, and even the reference points, of course, the globalization, is very similar. So the Czech students will laugh at the same references to video games that the French children will laugh at. And that's a big feeling that that's the normality. So I think the normality, I feel, but again, I'm, I'm, I'm old, I've got my family, I'm not living a young person's life anymore. So that's why I feel most frustrated that I can't feel how things have changed in reality. Mm -hmm. And how the right, this new generation has had 30 years of freedom since communism already. They've never experienced it. I don't know how much the communist experience that their parents and grandparents lived through is part of the psyche that young people carry with them today, as well as the modern life they live and the global references and the things. So they have a lot in common with the children from France and Western and European countries. They're all living the same life, basically, in terms of what they do and what they're interested in. But it's an interesting question, actually, then. Maybe have they forgotten what it can be without question for uh, Mariana and Matej as well, because you don't have that communist <laughs> heritage. But like, do you, uh, how, how is it in Hungary or, or Slovakia? Do you think that the 40 years of communism still play a significant role in how people Uh, think of Europe or perceive Europe even though it's 30 years later now? Yes, I mean I'm old enough to, to experience communism. Mm -hmm. I was 14 and I remember the very day the whole thing collapsed. Mm -hmm. uh, this was probably my second or third day in, uh, in secondary school and, and I still remember the Hungarian national anthem sang in a terribly, terribly jarring way, but it was just such a special moment and, mm -hmm. and the people were full of anticipation. And despite the fact that, you know, I grew up in the 80s, uh, where communism was not that bad, especially in Hungary, you know, compared to the other uh, Visegrad four countries even, um, it, it was so much worse, you know, in, the, in Czechoslovakia, in Romania, in Yugoslavia, uh, etc. But but I just I just felt I mean people just felt that uh, that uh, you know it's it's not okay that our rights are restricted to go abroad our rights are restricted somehow to to express ourselves uh, in fact you, you were not sent to prison but you could lose your existence and uh, and uh, and and. It, it's the, the government or the state could, could come down on you really badly, you know, if you behaved in a, in a non-conform way. And that's what I think, that there's a nostalgia uh, towards this, these 80s. Mm -hmm. and, and there is still a generation who... You mean there's a nostalgia for... Uh An for the 80s. Free, uh, life, I mean, or? no, it's something that, that there was no poverty mm -hmm. in, in a level that it exists in Hungary now. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what you cannot really see in, in, in public media. <laughs> that they, okay, I, I, would not, I, would not, I would call that propaganda media because mm -hmm. uh, now in Hungary, I, I don't know, because you have free, free press here in the Czech Republic and even in Slovakia. And, I believe in Ruma Romania as well, but in Hungary, uh, if you go to the countryside and talk to the people, they don't really read uh, any sort of uh, opposition media. They, 
absolutely everything is ruled by, uh, you know, the state propaganda, television, uh, local newspapers. They are losing. They are losing actually readers and and audi I mean audience because nobody wants to hear about the migrants anymore. Mm -hmm. But there's nothing else they have, and and you know this kind of state media is still kind of you know uh, t trying to enforce um, people to and, and keep keep uh, this kind of fake problem. Uh, you know, in, 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 in the public conscience and, uh, you know, as part of the public speech, which is absolutely awful. And, and they are setting people... Uh, do, are, do people compare that with the communism from before? Um, it's so much worse. It's worse now? Worse. Worse, because in the 80s, um, especially after 56, you know, we had a, a kind of a government who was afraid of 56. They, they didn't really want that to happen again, so they kind of kept some, some sort of an illusion that we are liberal, okay, we allow people to laugh at the system a little bit. Um, but uh, I wanted to use some sort of, the whole nation is being gaslighted. That's probably the, the, the best word if I don't want to use anything uh, rude in English. Offensive. So, yeah, <laughs> an offensive let's word. Not, let's not. <laughs> yes. But do people realize that's happening? Are people aware of that? No. They're not aware I mean, of most people, most people are so poor, you know, they are at the bottom of the Maslow pyramid. They, they, they just want to have shelter and, and enough food to eat, unfortunately. And more than. I think 300,000 people in Hungary could live in that sort of state. And 3 million, you know, quite close to that. That's a huge number. And to these people, if you want to talk about corruption, it means nothing to them. I mean, all they want to, to, to achieve is some sort of a normal life. And, uh, you know, me as a political activist, you know, I was unlucky enough to uh, get, get involved in Hungarian politics and, and saw the very bit of truth in Hungary. Maybe it's interesting, we were talking about that before, can you just like let us, uh, give us like a and brief overview of uh, your uh, involvement in Hungarian politics and how can it be different from involvement in Czech politics? Okay, if you, if you see that this badly designed t-shirt, you know, th that's my party, Tutel dot um, party or Bolca se hopsa, strana Bolca se hopsa. Strana Bolca se hopsa. Yeah, so if you would like to, you know, check out what we do, please go on our website. This is just, you know, uh, a little bit to the tutorial dot party. Uh, well, I, I decided, you know, I kind of went home a little bit more often in the recent years and I realized how bad the situation was and uh, I realized I just needed to do something about it, and uh, voting and uh, participating in demonstrations is no longer enough. Uh, you need to educate people. You need to get involved, you know, uh, on the on the the lowest level of society and try to talk to them. Try to uh, because there's a, a terrible apathy. Uh, that that's what I realized, uh, at least uh, you know in. in Hungarian people that you need to do something about it even if you just go out and realize okay your pavements are horrible you know they have cracks you know you just start painting them uh, just coloring them you know making them colorful and then people just gather around and 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 look at you hey what you're doing and then you start a conversation and then you pe feel people lighten up that oh, you're brave enough to do that that's so cool and um, you know, I, I, I experienced no negativity uh, in this sense and, and that kind of political activism that sounds or seems trivial for, 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 from an outsider point of view, it's extremely important. And it, I mean, our base is being built uh, this way. And I uh, realized that probably, you know, I should run for <laughs> a, a, an MP, a, an office, and, uh, you know, I didn't get a, too big of a to have a result, so I'm the worst politician <laughs> at KKP, uh, because I, I got something like 0.73% in the end, uh, in, a, in a really, really, really bad uh, constituency. So well, it's a good start. Yeah, I mean, Pirates started with 0 0.6. And look at, look at, look at, look at where we are now. And look at now. Uh, so, that's yeah. why I said so. so but, but that's it, you know, and, and 
you know, as we didn't have any uh, finances and we didn't have any money, we had to go there and collect the signature and talk to the people and do something about it. And that's how I learned so much about Hungarian re reality. So maybe parties should not be given, uh, you know, money before they get into the parliament. They need really, you really, really need to work hard to, uh, you know, achieve that kind of um, confidence uh, from the people. Just to uh, come back to the uh, communist to democracy, or maybe return to in Czechoslovakia in under Vasaholo, but the return to Europe was like uh, the slogan in the early 90s. And I was talking to Matej because you know the Czech and Slovak uh, history is very similar, but now we're in a situation when the Slovak government is way more pro-European than the Czech government and even the yes. public. So Matej, can you maybe say why you think it's so? With, or what, what, what is what is the reason that like you know a similar nation with a similar history tends to be way more pro-European? Uh, well, we had a little discussion just before we yeah, started I'm, I'm here, but uh, but uh, I think that the, it's because of the memory of a nation. I mean, uh, Slovakia. I well, I, I grew up in the late uh, 80s and 90s, so I recall communists only just uh, partially. But uh, I uh, very good remember uh, 90s in Slovakia and that was the period when the country uh, was uh, or has, has to decide whether it wants to be the part of the West or East world I mean due to the Mecha regime mm -hmm. uh, so and that time uh, it was a really fight for freedom and for a democracy and all people now remember that period of time so uh, that's why most of uh, Slovak people uh, would like and fight for uh, living in a West standard and living in a West world. And uh, Czech uh, and uh, Czech people and the Czech Republic uh, was uh, never in such situation. So uh, they uh, or here in Prague we don't know and in the, in the whole Czech Republic uh, what is the feeling like and uh, we still think that uh, we are in a Europe, in the middle of the Europe and nothing can uh, happen and it doesn't matter whether we will be part of the EU or not. Uh, but uh, I think that uh, that's a big mistake and uh, we should uh, look at other countries, what happened there. I mean. Uh, uh, what happened now in Ukraine and uh, so on. So uh, this is the reason the, the 90s in the, in the Slovakia was a really a strange period and uh, uh, but it has, it has a positive influence now. So, so the Slovakians know what can be at stake because they were there maybe before while Czechs don't really understand like how important it is or what can be lost? Uh, yes, uh, they were almost there. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, the election uh, in uh, 1998 uh, was the change point mm -hmm. when we started uh, uh, running back uh, to the West. It's very interesting you were talking about the heart of Europe, right? Which is like how Czechs like to call themselves. But like, how do you guys, this is for everybody, how, uh, uh, what do you make out of the fact that in the heart of Europe, there's barely one fifth of the people who participate in the European election. It's like after Slovakia is the second lowest turnout in in Europe, so it doesn't really seem like people uh, care about it, even though they're proclaiming they're in the heart of Europe. What 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 is your take on it? Why do you think people are not participating or are not taking part? Because Czech politicians were not able to persuade the people that it's the important uh, election. It's important to come there because uh, most of the law is created in the European Parliament, on the Czech Parliament, and uh, Czech people do not realize that. They are not ever... Do you guys agree? Or? I think there's something uh, deeper than that. Uh, I, that's my thinking from someone looking from I'm a bit out, from outside. I'm mm -hmm. really surprised that people getting their freedom, their right to vote, do not rush for, uh, for this. But actually that's something that happened as well when uh, right to vote were given to women. Not that many women went to vote. It, it, it took some time to get their habits. Uh, same with foreigners in the West. Uh, in some countries foreigners can vote for some time. They're not really interested in politics because they're not used to it. My other take is maybe that's because as well of communism. You could you had elections during communism. That was, a, that was <laughs> yeah, but that was a joke. Elections. But I think some people still think it's a joke. You still have the same politicians on TV, and you hear this on the 
West for the, from people who don't vote, they're not really that interested because that's always the same people telling the same uh, lies to get the same money and they know uh, so they're all corrupt and so on. And so what's the use of voting? There's no really a difference. And here, because of the communism, the joke was really there, the lies were really there, they're just used to it and they didn't make the switch for voting. So I think it's because of communism. That's my take on this. Mm. But, um, I think that's very interesting, actually, I have this sort of experience when I first came here. Because mm. I think France is very politically, people talk a lot about politics mm. in France. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And in England, too, Always people more. talk about politics mm. in, at dinner tables. Uh, mm -hmm. Every family has a history of being conservative or Labour, or people know about the political life. And the same thing when I came here in 1990. Yeah, communism is, politics is stupid. We don't talk about it. It's not part of our life. We, there's, there's no point. There's no point talking about it. There's no living debates around any topics. So in people's houses, or in the cottages, <coughs> politics isn't part of what people talk about. They don't live politics. They even if avoid it. I think that's the uh, mm -hmm. same uh, Vaslav Havel's way. If you're a dissident, you just do your own life uh, uh, next to it. And, and you can carry on with it. Yeah, hmm. the, the private person versus the, yeah. the politician. Oh, yeah, and, exactly. yeah, yeah, and, and I absolutely agree with you that that uh, during the communism, and especially in the 70s, 80s, uh, people became private people because there was not really anything concrete to fight against. Hmm. And that made them absolutely passive. Hmm. They say, okay, I have my life, I have my job, yeah, everything is provided beard, for me. Beard. Why fight? You know, we, we don't re really need to talk about politics because they will become corrupt anyway. So what, what does it have to do with me? And that's the kind of attitude that led to the situation yeah. in Hungary right now. And then that's the problem also for the younger generation because I was, I was brought up with my parents having political opinions. My parents weren't especially political, but they had very clear political opinions. So I was brought up, that is part of life. You have political ideas, you talk about and think about it. And if you see a headline in the paper, it's, it means something to you. And yeah, and, and I wonder here again if the younger generation, I'm just very interested in the, the younger Czech generation, they probably haven't been brought up with hearing their parents and grandparents talking, discussing political issues at home. So it's not important for them. And then even in England, when you get and that's for normal elections, you get to the European elections, like I said, people don't realise the significance and the impact it could have really on their lives. Well, we are not so used to it that it's a normal part of life to have a political opinion. Mm. That's, uh, I think that's uh, very significant here in the Czech Republic when you compare it to Great Britain or UK. And that's maybe the result of the communist regime, as you said before. Mm. But to get the back mindset, to, I, I would say. To get back to communism, there's something sometimes uh, uh, people try to explain to me what communism was. And I remember two days ago I had a question Do you have panelak in France? <laughs> <laughs> you do. You yeah, do. So, yeah. Sometimes there are things that you point this is communist, this is communist art, oh, this is the things you had during communism. And we had the same thing during De Gaulle and Monkidou. Mm. So, uh, not everything is uh, <laughs> so different. We yeah. had somehow s governments were kind of stronger with police uh, in the 70s, uh, 60s, 70s. It, it cooled down during the 80s, same in the West and in the East. So There's been a little story about that, so that's very interesting. So, I used to come here and they, oh, I used to love it because the waiters were very rude here. Of <laughs> yes. yeah, so I was brought up in a consumer society where you service customer. Especially in and you go to you go to buy you go to the store you go to the clothes store and then somebody jumps on you and they just, and I says just leave me alone I just, just leave me alone. I came from that society then I came here and just everybody left me alone it was brilliant it was like, uh, <laughs> it was like three salespeople talking in the corner and I'm, I'm trying to get their attention and they're like no it's like stop stop back here I don't care and I could have like it's always such a different culture but actually I found it very refreshing at that time but I always thought yeah that must be a communist thing and then you go to the the, the waiters were very rude in the pub. Yeah, so some, so we some shouldn't of be rude. They should be like begging for tips for the kind of the tradition of it. Is yes. it like we are famous for. But the state is like. But then I was But like you say, but then I assumed it was a communist thing. But then I went to Vienna, and the waiters were rude in Vienna as well. Yeah, yeah, I think well, it must be an Austro-Hungarian thing. Yeah, to the Netherlands. 
I think they're the words. I lived there, and when I spent a weekend in, in England, I was uh, surprisingly and polite with people because mm. I took such <laughs> habits. So, yes, yes. No, it's not the common thing. Uh, the interesting thing we were talking about uh, with David uh, before is uh, his take on, like, you know, he's walking around Prague and he's seeing all these election posters. Uh, I don't know, you probably noticed them as well when, when you walk. and. Uh, he said, oh, they're very bland, like, I, it doesn't seem that there's an issue or, you know... Yeah, uh, a message. Or there, it doesn't right? seem that there's a message, which I thought was, like, super interesting from somebody who doesn't maybe, like, really speak the language, cannot read it all, mm. but, like, you can tell there's, like, doesn't seem there's, that, that, that there's a uh, unifying message of this election or, like, for, uh, 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 like, yeah, Czech Republic Europe. Do you feel that as well? Yes, I mean, that's why we came up with completely empty promises, like... Uh, uh, living forever and free beer and uh, no taxes and these kind of rubbish uh, promises that can never be fulfilled. Uh, I mean, because because that's what people focus on. Uh, if you promise them something, you know, grandiose, they're going to vote for you, which is wrong. Obviously, people should be taught to to uh, vote based on you know to, to to make an informed decision based on what that person does not what that person promises so we need to challenge those kind of slogans and then uh, once once people will get into the habit of uh, you know having this attitude uh, then then you will see other messages well because uh, the the, lead, the Czech oligarch party the leading party you know their their message is strong Czech strong Czechia and I'm not. I'm, I, I'm, not, I'm not really sure what it means. And you know, just like yeah, you know, what does it, it mean it's, um, exactly? You know, and because what I'm trying to get to isn't this like one of the reasons why, why people don't show up for these elections? Because there seems there, that there's not like an issue or a theme. Well, he, he tries to pretend that he's uh, Czech Trump, and uh, it's probably going to affect certain part of uh, voters. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I think that the. Uh, we should uh, do it in a different way. We should promote uh, our Pirate Party program. As uh, I'm talking as a candidate mm -hmm. for Pirate sure, Party sure. right now. We are in a Pirate Party. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, I think we do not. Uh, we shouldn't use the cheap slogans. And uh, I mean, this kind of discussion is a great way how to promote uh, what our goals are in the European election. And uh, I think that the. Czech Trump is not going to work very well, very well in this election. I hope so. I was interested, but the point we're making is that even, even the slogans now are just empty. Because normally, anyway, everybody, they're just a simple slogan. It's like, oh, people should live a um, dignified life, or <coughs> the Czech Republic shouldn't have foreigners in it, or whatever the slogan mm -hmm. is, the, the thing. So the slogan's always going to be simplistic. This time the slogan was absolutely nothing. We will represent you in Europe. No, we will represent you in Europe. We will represent you in Europe. There's some other like of even even less than really the normal yeah. slogan. It was same as the kind of cheap uh, campaigns we have uh, for local elections. Uh, I am this city. No, I am this city. I am the <laughs> true this city. <laughs> when when you have a political party, they try to work out something that. Uh, is more uh, showing their ideas. Sometimes it fits, sometimes it doesn't fit. I like pirate uh, slogans, not for what there is behind. I like what there is behind too, but uh, it's, they usually play with words, so mm -hmm. it helps me mm -hmm. to learn Czech. You know, in a, in a <laughs> yeah, yes, okay, I yeah, have yeah. to search for three hours to understand really exactly. uh, the, the, the game. <laughs> it is it's kind of interesting. But I think what Matthew said was actually very interesting for me, as, um, as for, for, the, for the awareness missing, is what the European Parliament actually does decide that influences people here. And I think it's what people, that's what people don't know. That's what people don't know and that's what we would like to change in the uh, upcoming five years. Mm -hmm. That we would like to bring uh, European Parliament uh, closer to the Czech people, that we would like to present our results uh, in the European Parliament uh, in, uh, in the Czech Republic, like in an uh, ordinary base. And uh, also we would like to know uh, people's opinion about uh, our work in the European Parliament and allow them to uh, make suggestions what we should do, what we shouldn't do, and so on. And I believe that this is the way how we can uh, get the European Parliament closer to the people and uh, the work uh, that is uh, uh, going to be done there. Oh, okay, and uh, because 
I don't know. Maybe maybe some viewers are going to decide uh, to to vote in the Czech Republic. And uh, what kind of agendas do you have? As a you mean me personally or as a pirate party? Uh, maybe it talk about matter. maybe, it maybe, maybe yeah, let, because let's, we, let's give us well, some we've been talking about the pirate agendas a lot in, in here yeah. in other discussions. Maybe you can Mati talk about your yeah. personal agenda or what? What would yeah personal? If you, I'm if, 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 if you wake you up on the twenty seventh of May <laughs> and you open your eyes, you go like, oh my god, oh my I'm god, getting elected an MEP. Like what? What, what would you put? Pirate party got sixty five percent. Okay, my candidacy number is 15, so it's very improbable, but... Uh, <laughs> I mean, ne never say never, never say never. Uh, but me personally, I'm interested in uh, international issues and uh, defense issues and international trade issues. So that's the kind uh, of uh, group of uh, the things that I would like to work with. So uh, in the committees that, uh, works, uh, that work in uh, these eras. And uh, I would like to uh, make the European uh, defense force stronger than it's right now, because I think that it can help uh, to calm down the situation in Europe uh, uh, after the migration like crisis and Syria. so on. So yeah, I think Syria. this is uh, what can help us to uh, lower down the influence of a populist party, yes. to strengthen the uh, border of the, of, the, of the European Union. And uh, this is my personal agenda there, mm -hmm. uh, and this is what I, like, what I would like to help with uh, in the European Parliament. But uh, anyway, I think the issue that I was talking here before to bring the European Parliament closer to the Czech people, it's very important as well. And uh, I, I believe that all our candidates would like to work on this, because it's very important. Uh, one thing, no walls, please. <laughs> sure, no walls. This, this is no there the... are already walls around Europe, so... Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know, I'm quite ashamed of it, but... The... Um, mostly in Hungary. <laughs> I have an agenda that's uh, requiring from you to enlarge your views, because I think it's not only to check people. Uh, maybe French outcome for elections is higher than in Czech Republic, but European elections always have the uh, lowest, the lowest. Mm. and the lowest is about referendums about European citizens <coughs> actually. That's the lowest uh, historically in France, so we must be... Uh, but, but what's the lowest number? It's about 50% or well, something Well, it's about like 30, sometimes under 30, mm. and that's really catastrophic when it's okay. under 30 in France. Maybe it's usual for Czechs, but... But, it, but it's the still is, the double number of people... Don't feel it, it means they don't, don't, they don't feel they don't think it's interesting. They they prefer to vote for presidential where they have the choice to elect one person that can do whatever be after. Mm -hmm. And there are so many people voting that their voice is completely diluted into diverse opinions. When you vote for uh, uh, five hundred or seven hundred people uh, in a parliament, then you have you know you have to have discussions and so on. So I think. As pirates, we, you will represent also pirates of countries like in France where they unlikely they are unlikely to get pirates. And I think you can do that, that same job in Europe. And that would show that Europe works, that you're an MP with a constituency which is a country, but you can work for other people in other countries, in other constituencies. Sure, you are, you are right. and. Uh... We would like to cooperate with uh, other pirate parties all around the Europe, and to uh, we will try to help uh, to strengthen the pirate movement all around the Europe. And uh, by this uh, means, we would like to uh, also do what you suggested. So, I mean, uh, uh, my primary focus is to focus on. Uh, Czech Republic, but uh, anyway, I will still try to help to Czech uh, or to France, uh, French Pirate Party to help uh, to Czech, uh, to, to French uh, uh, people uh, to know better about European Parliament. Yeah, it's pretty interesting we're starting uh, to talk about the Pirate Movement, right? Uh, we can be probably sure that the Czech Pirate Party will by far be the most uh, successful Pirate Party in Europe in these yes. elections, and it's even like the most successful uh, party party in the European Union as we speak. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, guys, why do you think so? Why do you think uh, pirates are so successful in Czech and not maybe in Slovakia, Hungary, or 
friends, it's like, you know, it's, it's now it's the second strongest party and the strongest opposition party in polling. What, what's your take on that? I, I can talk about Hungarian Pirate Party because mm -hmm. um, I think they, the, the last time, the first and the last time they ran for election was in 2014. Mm -hmm. And um, obviously the, the results were not very high, as everyone would expect uh, with a party who has no, who has no basis, who has no uh, financial um, kind of means that, that, they would not do, uh, that they would not do so well. Uh, but uh, actually things got worse uh, because, um, you know, after um, running for election, I, I kind of not 100% agreed with uh, the two-tailed party kind of agenda anymore. I, 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 wanted to, I wanted to do more. I wanted to, 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 to search for some other out-of-the-box way of thinking kind of organization. So I got in touch with uh, the Hungarian pirates. And to my horror, you know, the, the leader of the Hungarian party, because I checked out, uh, you know, the website and I sent him a, a text message and, uh, you know, I was referred to this guy um, by other members, ex-members of the Hungarian Pirate Party. And I realized that that guy, you know, the, the leader of the Hungarian Pirate Party is... Uh, you know, kind of spreading the, the, the most awful uh, conspiracy theory, uh, Fidesz propaganda. Oh. So then, then, you know, I was there and said, okay, what, what can we do in this situation? Is there anything we can do at all? So I went back to two tailed party mm. and then said, okay, guys, you're still the most sensible solution despite being a satirical party. You know, at least you do something, at least you have some sort of an achievement, at least you could hack the system, you have results. Okay, you, you have my vote and I'm going to go back and obviously do that. What? So no pirates. What about, what about you, Alex? You're, you said you were a member of the pirate party in France. And... Yeah, I joined in 2012 and I left. Well, I didn't leave really. I'm still interested in mm -hmm. what they do and I follow up and I help sometimes. Uh, so why do you think it's in Czech that pirates are so successful? So there's a structural difference between mm -hmm. France and Czech Republic is the um, way the elections are run. Uh, that's Rick Falvink, uh, who is the founder of the pirates, he said France, UK, no chance. Because uh, you have one constituency per seat for uh, general elections. That's the main election in the country. Everybody's looking at this. So if you want to be a party, you have to be there. Well, if you have one constituency per seat, you have two, two parties, left or right. It's kind of changing nowadays. In it's the middle of the program. We're actually going to get to Britain. You, you, have yeah, someone, yeah. you have someone kind of in the middle or on the side that can hijack the system and get a few seats. Yes. Or, but uh, but can be it's mainly, way, it's mainly like the. Nigel Farage oh, you, know, exactly. you take general check general elections. You take the two first ones, and then you reproduce this as many times as you have seats. So yeah, of course you have two parties. Yes, they did. Mm. Yeah. So we were talking about it with Mati as well. Why? in Czech it works and why it's not possible in Slovakia and I think you had a really good idea about like how the parties are different. Well, I think it depends on the political situation in general, but uh, if I can compare Czech Republic and Slovakia in this question, uh, I think that the, here in the Czech Republic we were very lucky that there was no relevant liberal party. So uh, we could start to occupy the liberal voters in the Czech Republic because because uh, because uh, we are now the only re relevant liberal party here in the Czech Republic, so uh, we can gain all liberal voters, and uh, there are uh, plenty of them. And you have free media. And we have, we have free media, <laughs> luckily. Uh, but uh, in Slovakia, there are more <coughs> liberal party right now in the present day. So uh, Slovak uh, Pirate Party is going to have a very difficult times there and they are not the really established there so for right now because uh, in Slovakia you need to gain like uh, 10,000 of signatures if you would like to establish a new a new party mm -hmm. and uh, it's really difficult to gain 10,000 of signatures here in the Czech Republic it was like uh, 1,000 or 3,000 so uh, so uh, several times less but uh, I, I think this was this is the main issue in the Slovakia that the, there are other liberal parties and uh, 
you would like to be as a pirate party in Slovakia, you need to uh, fight with other liberal parties, but it's, uh, uh, th th that's really difficult. Mm -hmm. So like, as, as you said, there's no liberal party in Hungary. No, but there's no free media either, so... You know, if, if you have just propaganda, then you have... I mean, w what can you do? How do you find people, you know? Because liberal intelligentsia uh, gets their information from the media, gets their information from periodicals, whatever, mm -hmm. but these do not exist. So h how do you kind of address them? It's really hard to get to the people. Yeah, it's Even extremely Even newspapers, there's no, there's no liberal intelligence to um, get to there are some, mm. but um, but it's it's, uh, it's still you know uh, mainly ruled by the. F it's all in Budapest, and you can see in the results that in Budapest there were some opposition parties who could win <coughs> certain constituencies, mm. but in the countryside, nothing whatsoever. And what about private television? No. Okay. <laughs> private televisions are owned by an oligarch. Okay, so. Actually, this Absolutely is, no chance. I'm going to uh, turn to David. This is not supposed to be a Brexit discussion. <laughs> and, 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 and it's not going to be. We are going to yeah, when we were talking about the structural differences and how uh, a party can emerge in such an amazing fashion as the Czech Republic Party, it's like, you know, in Britain, the two party system is collapsing as mm. we speak. And we're going to see it in the European elections when now it seems the Conservative Party can come in in fifth. <laughs> not bad, really. I, yeah, well, not yeah, 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 yeah. I, li I literally just like checked the polling so. on the, yeah, yeah. Uh, the Guardian today, and they're, they're yeah, yeah. about to get score like eight percent. So, yeah, yeah. so can you imagine something like a pirate party emerging in the, in in England in, or in Britain in the future? Or again, again, I think not fully for the reasons you were saying. But I, again, I'm not a, any kind of a political expert at all. But um, I say no because I think the the party systems are so well established, and the Liberal Party is is well enough established. Mm -hmm. The, the same thing we have an established Liberal Party, and uh, I'd imagine the pirates would take that. But having said that, there's a big tradition of um, absurd parties yeah, in Britain. Like so party, I was yeah. when I was a child, the Monster Raving Loony Party would always get the, for the Monster Raving Loony Party, <laughs> which is based on Monty yeah, Python yeah. characters, yeah. and uh, they always <laughs> got a certain percentage of the vote. They'd always get the like the basic people who didn't who wanted to vote but didn't want to vote for anybody. Well, good virtue to the fact I've, I voted, so I believe in democracy, and I don't want to support any of these parties because I don't mind them. Yeah. <laughs> so, you can get the absurd party, can get it. Lord Buckethead did very well against oh, Theresa May. Yes. <laughs> so, but why is them. Nigel Farage so, in this uh, movement so, um, in your opinion, what, why are they so popular? And why are they, why did they took the Again, lead? Again, for what my opinion is worth, I think this populist, mm. populist is politics works. News? Works out. There's always, and I'm talking about this. Um, there's always an insular, uh, insecure element of society, and it's also this thing like we've got it, we've got it, but you could lose it. The immigrants are going to take it away from you. Anything that's wrong is because of them. If you let more of them in, you're going to lose your family, your friends, your neighbours are going to be from. But it's kind of it's an interesting comparison because in, in England, of course, there, there are already a lot of immigrants. It's a very Multi, certainly the big cities are very multicultural. I'm not sure, I think it's like 8% of the population is, is like immigrant Europe from India or Pakistan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, here, here there's a great fear of immigrants, there aren't any immigrants. Yeah, one third uh, of the Apart population in. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is actually another of those totally side issue, but I, I like the interest by the term expat, cause, mm -hmm. which is a very colonial background, but basically it means a, an old, it meant a white Western immigrant. <laughs> Basically, you know, an immigrant from a rich Western country mm -hmm. is an immigrant, but we get called expat. We have a special term for us because yeah, we're not we're not we're not we're not, we're not, we're not, yeah, we we're not have enough economic. To be <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> you can, you can you know, tell it as a first, first sight, so yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. And that so, means more or less. A, well, actually, I like expat because you're away from your country. Mm. Where immigrant means you're g coming. You've, you've chosen you're to coming. leave for financial yeah. or political and reasons. In Europe, yeah. people mix up with immigrants and immigrants. And and I now think we also, call everybody immigrants. And I think also, like, the part of being an expat, it's like it, it doesn't need to be permanent. Like, there's this sense you might go back yeah. to your original country, which is like yeah. not the case with immigrants. Well, it's funny that you kind of identify with the country, but I had a lot of immigrants. So I've got friends here from Armenia, who was born in the Czech Republic, lived here, speaks Czech. But he still considers himself to be Armenian, and he married an Armenian girl here. 
but it's been absolutely perfect check. It's very much went through the check education system. So, yeah, I don't know. Very much except for it. One more thing, because, because mm. time is always short. Yes, 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 yes. Like, what I was trying to get to, we were talking mm. about uh, the uh, pirate goal of bringing European issues and European Parliament issues closer to the people so they understand better, which we can probably all agree is important, mm -hmm. but like just to compare, so we have a, you, I, I know you're living here, so you don't follow the European elections in your home countries, but like just to uh, have an overall idea, what, what, is the, what is the main issue parties are running on in France, Hungary, or Britain, or Britain, it seems it's... <laughs> yeah. It's easy, Soros. Soros? George Soros, yes. It's the he's migrants a, and George Soros. It's a, little, it's a little weird because he's an American. No, he's Hungarian actually. Oh, he's, he's still a Hungarian, Hungarian citizen, oh, okay. but he's the arch enemy and the okay. um, resident evil, really. Of the Republican Party, and Orban is in America now with President Trump. Yes, yeah. He but then, yeah, the first time in years, actually. He's been, first time. He was invited. He's delighted, obviously. I bet George Soros came up in that conversation. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Alex, what, 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 is, what are the uh, European elections so, about in France? Yeah, that's always a boring uh, immigration uh, so-called problem for years. Uh, there's something that came up with Yellow Vest as well, is uh, how do you address uh, people's voices and uh, citizens' participation. So there's a lot of uh, things and uh, stupid things uh, said about this, but it's kind of, I would say that's the second most important topic of the campaign. How, do, how how people voice their concerns or when yeah, they protest? Yeah, yeah. There was after the starting of the Yellow Vest protest, you had some kind of a debate uh, led by the government, collecting ideas and things like this. Some of the forms were pre-written, or but that was kind of a attempt to do it. And the Yellow Vest, they wanted to have some kind of a Swiss. Uh, style debate, which is not fitting with French culture. Uh, so but can you just like explain what a Swiss well, style debate is? For kind us? of a, everybody could come with a topic, and we would vote vote on, and uh, that would become law somehow. Oh. So that's a referendum d'initiative citoyenne. Citizens initiative referendum. So there's something in the constitution that allows a referendum with joint uh, citizenship and uh, parliamentary. Uh, uh, initiative, but you need so many signatures that it will never happen. Mm -hmm. There's a promise to lower the number of signatures to make it maybe happen, but it's still joined with the parliament and uh, Yellow Vest. They don't want to hear about uh, any authority dictating this. So there's a kind of a debate there, which is a bit interesting, but it's a bit too superficial, I think. But that could be after election, could be a, a nice uh, topic. Interesting. Mm -hmm. And in Slovakia, maybe what's the well in Slovakia? I think it's similar in uh, all EU because the main topic is Slovakia. In Slovakia, is uh, protection of Slovakia and uh, migration and uh, such things. So I think it's really similar in all EU. And um, the second most uh, common topic is like uh, slogans like "We will do it better in the EU" or something like that. That's uh, like. The cheap slogans you we're, we're, we're coming back into yeah. the slogans that don't really yeah. mean much. Yeah. And just like a twist on this question, right? It's like now imagine, uh, th th now we're going to come back to Czech. What do you think should be the topic for Czech people? Or like what, to, what, what should be the issue in Czech regarding European Union ba based on. Well, ask the people, you know, <laughs> I mean, y you need to do research in order to, you know, build Well, I'm doing campaign. research right now. Right? <laughs> yes. I'm, 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 I'm asking people who, who live okay. in this country what do what they, and, and are not Czech, which kind of gives you this outside perspective. What do you think should be the main issue for Czech education. people? Education, I mean, uh, improving education because, you know, some, um, there, are, there are still some, it's, it's so much better than in Hungary, but, but there are still issues. Uh, and then healthcare system, which functions better than uh, you know the Hungarian system, but there are still issues, and 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 obviously uh, to to prepare people for the climate change, for the effects of the mm -hmm. climate change, we cannot really um, you know avoid this is going to happen no matter what. You can slow down some stuff, but you know still you know you need to prepare people. Um, that they, they will have to live together with the effects. Even, you know, if they have to kind of welcome some people from not very successful parts of the country to, to, to share, you know, con your country with them. Because obviously you can't really let them die. 
um, the, the, this is the kind of agenda and and you know to to teach people that uh, they should actively participate you know in their own things to make them understand that they can actually make a difference you know even by you know just some baby steps even you know just to improve something in their uh, you know direct environment something like that what do you think guys should should matter more to check people regarding your I think addressing people uh because there's something I don't get with Czech Republic, so my uh, cheap slogan would be "What the fuck?" Or <laughs> <laughs> please, please explain. Uh, it, it seems to me that Czech Republic is very, very well off now compared to neighboring countries, yeah. compared to even countries like France. If you look at unemployment uh, rate, and we might even have the lowest one in the EU these days. They they all agree because you have flags on when there's a reconstruction somewhere, you have the European flag, so it's kind of obvious that's thanks to uh, exchange you have with neighbors without Germany. Uh, I think uh, half of the Czech labor force is unemployed. Or, so Europe and the neighboring countries are um, uh, co the cause of this uh, better off uh, state. And still, there is a majority in the opinion against all this so not not the being well off but uh, being uh, in the EU and so on so I, I don't get it and I really so I, I there's something I don't get this is why uh, I would have a slogan please, please explain so, uh -huh. so yeah it's a kind of uh, addressing them because uh, I think you need to, to figure out what's happening there it's very interesting but I don't have the answer we yeah. don't have any other slogan to, <laughs> to talk to people. What do you think, David? Uh, I think exactly the thing to say, well, that's what this, this whole project is about. But yeah, exactly the same thing, just awareness. Awareness is a big thing. There's um, the Monty Python sketch, what is, what, what is the E? It's a parody on the Monty Python sketch, what has the European Union ever done for you? And there's a big list of like 30 yeah. things, which are very basic to what has the European Union done for you? And we don't, I think it's just, like, like we're saying, it's not part of our common consciousness. Mm -hmm. People don't talk about it. People at dinner tables don't talk about European Parliament decisions. Mm -hmm. They're not in the news, they're not on the front pages, they're not on the, the national television news. Today the European Parliament decided this, this and this. So we just don't, uh, but the thing, the, the tiny Brexit, yeah, the big Brexit thing later, but the thing about Brexit is people, oh, it's, yes, obviously, obviously the opinion does a lot for us. Yes, you see the flags everywhere, mm -hmm. every reconstruction. And that's why the Brexit, nobody went to vote, because obviously we want to stay in the European Union. And so the people who thought, well, obviously that's not going to happen, didn't go and vote. And then the and people who were motivated by the slogans, protect us against immigrants because they're going to take everything away from you, were angry and motivated. Then, well, we've got to go and vote, otherwise... And it's... Yeah, uh, that message of what is European... What did, and how to make that a message interesting, though. Because, yes, yeah. you're, you're happy now They'll because we're in Europe. They'll find yeah, that's <laughs> the <laughs> 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 To just end with Mati, uh, when we were talking uh, before the stream, he was, uh, one point he made about the difference between Czech and Slovakia is that maybe in Slovakia there's way more push in, in, in the public to let people know what the EU actually did for them. Yeah, yeah as you said, it's about message because uh, in Slovakia, um, well, opinions are different, but uh, what thing, one thing that is uh, promoted there is uh, the results of the membership uh, in the European Union. That means that uh, for the last 10 years, in television, uh, on, on the radio, in newspapers, uh, you can find uh, the advertisement on the European Union and uh, what was done by the means uh, provided by the European Union in Slovakia. I mean, uh, how many hospitals were built, how many schools were um, uh, built, and so on, how many uh, uh, kilometers of highways uh, were, were built. And I think this is important uh, for people to uh, let them realize what the European Union mm. provides them. So, uh, so I think that this is something what we should start doing here in the Czech Republic, to uh, let's call it an advertisement on the European Union. I mean, it's not a real advertisement because it's just uh, you, you just provide facts, mm -hmm. uh, so yeah. and and people can mm -hmm. decide whether it's uh, really uh, worth it to be a member of the EU or not. But mm -hmm. right now in the Czech Republic, uh, people usually 
do not know about it because uh, there is no uh, no uh, advertisement on this. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's like a fake um, idea. Yes, the Czech Republic is doing very well. It's very prosperous. Therefore, it could manage on its own because we've got a very strong economy and we. And how much of that is because of European Union support of infrastructure? Mm -hmm. sure. Yeah. All right, guys, as, as usual, this gives you a chance. If anybody of you wants to address the people who are watching directly and tell them something, maybe encourage them to vote or, yes, go or vote. number 15. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. It's up to you. It's, it's, it's an open forum for you guys. And we can start with Matej, who's the candidate. Uh, I would say uh, come to this election because it's the most important election in the Czech Republic. And uh, even if you don't think so, uh, you will see it in five years that uh, we can change a lot in the European Parliament. So come and uh, support us, please. Would you like to add anything, guys? Well, just before the uh, European Union campaign, uh, I've been uh, campaigning for people to register, so expats. And uh, yesterday, it's, it was a bit late, but I posted messages saying that we're going to have that discussion. So if some of them are listening, well, and you are registered in a Czech Republic, yeah, please do and go there. Experience voting in a different country, that's a... <laughs> I, I see many differences and many ways you could cheat, actually. <laughs> and in France, we have... A, Machines? A, no, vote, voting um, ballot box that are transparent because people were putting stuff inside before uh, ah. the opening of the... So it has to be transparent so that people see... Uh, oh, that it's yeah, yeah. Going. They don't do it here. Apparently, it doesn't help for any fraud or anything, but it's always curious to see these differences too, so it's just by, for the experience. I think for the choice, pirates are not a bad choice, it's quite a good one then, but it's up to you still. And, uh, but the ex experience it. Otherwise, uh, if you're from another European country, there's still a way to vote for many of you in the embassy or by post, that's another option. And maybe there are pirate party there that would help the Czech one. I say that, just vote, just vote, and, and basically not voting for in the European elections is actively supporting the nationalist parties who say people don't populists. care about Europe. The populists. So the numbers, yeah. yeah. So even having 35% of the nation voting instead of 28% is important by itself. So whoever you vote for, just exactly. it, it does make a difference just from that point of view. Exactly. In, in Hungary, there will be a high turnover, but, but it's going to be beneficial for the yeah. government. Uh, so so if, even if you, um, I mean, some people from Hungary or Hungarian people who are willing to vote in Hungary are watching this by any chance, you know, just go and vote because this is the most important uh, um, EP elections uh, in history because that, that might be the last. You know, if uh, we are doing really badly, uh, you know, as, as, as an opposition, uh, there might be no more election. And you cannot travel, you know, within the European freely, and you cannot work, and you, you cannot send your kids to foreign universities if you're dissatisfied with the Hungarian educational system. So it's extremely, extremely important to go and vote. And here in the Czech Republic, obviously vote for the pirates. Thank you very much. Thank you guys, thank you very much for coming. Thank you. My se loučíme pro zatím a uvidíme se zase za asi hodinku, ani ne, za půl hodinky zpátky. Thank you, bye guys.